Rise of the Exile, Book One of the Shadow of the Tyrant King series by J. D. Matter. Chapter Twenty One New Found Wealth. They excitedly walked to Blake's house after school. Lucas tucked his precious wand in his waistband, safely out of sight from Black Eagle soldiers. They wanted to discuss what to do with Lucas's newfound power, but they were smart enough to stay quiet until they were in the privacy of the house. Along the way, they noticed an unusually high concentration of Black Eagle soldiers in the streets. They were banging on the doors of every house in the neighborhood. While banging, they yelled, Tax collection, open up! The soldiers hauled loads of gold coins to the saddlebags upon their horses in the street. That's not enough. Ordinance 22-22B states, Any man, woman, or child who can't pay their taxes will be subject to no less than five years in prison and or hard labor. Several people refused to commit to hard labor and were dragged away. The boys ran to the Leatherhide's house. Blake was fearful that his parents might have been hauled off for not having enough money. Gigi was not concerned about his parents, for he knew they had plenty of money. When Blake burst through the door, Gretchen was crying as Fuga hugged her. Blake was relieved that at least both his parents were still home. Ma, what happened? They raised the taxes again and we can't afford it. Yeah, we saw them out there taking people's money. If you couldn't pay, uh, how come they didn't take you away? Because, said Fuga, I volunteered for hard labor. Starting tomorrow, I'll be out tilling soil out on them new farms to the north. Just yesterday, I saw them herding a lot of livestock, too. So I don't think they'll be letting you boys leave town to hunt anymore. There ain't gonna be no more food shortage, at least not for them anyways. I'm sure no one's gonna afford what they'll charge for food. That is, if they don't just keep it all for themselves in the first place. Things sure are getting worse around here. Excuse me, said Lucas. I'll be right back. He ran off the front porch and down the street. Where you suppose he's going? asked Blake. Looks as though he's headed toward his house, answered Gigi. While Lucas was gone, Gretchen prepared a chicken dinner. Blake, Gigi, and Justin were forced to help, and they felt like they were back in the chemistry lab slinging various ingredients around. Lucas returned just in time for dinner. He was carrying a large wooden box, which resembled a suitcase, and he had a sizable blank canvas tucked beneath his arm. He propped it up in the corner and adjourned to the dinner table where a place had been set for him. Well, where have you been? asked Blake. And what's in that little case you brought? Those are my art supplies. I'm going to work on a new painting tonight. When it's done, you won't have any more money troubles. Mr. Leatherhide, you won't have to do slave labor. That's very kind of you, said Fuga. But I doubt anyone would be willing to spend money on something like a painting nowadays. People need their money for all these new taxes. No one will purchase this painting, said Lucas. It'll be yours to keep. After dinner, everyone went to the living room. While Lucas worked on the painting, everyone else had an involved discussion about the many troubles the Black Eagle was burdening them with. Lucy Switch down the street looked like she put on a little weight round the midsection, said Gretchen. Then rumors started floating round that she was expecting. I tried to tell the gales to hush up, but sure enough, the Black Eagle came a-banging on her door this morning, hauled her off, and she ain't been seen since. Fuga clenched his teeth and snorted. How long we gotta put up with this? They run people off? They take their babies? They take our money? I guess we're lucky they don't just take our lives, too. A tyrant king can't be much worse than what they're doing. But, sir... The tyrant king probably would exterminate everyone, said Gigi. So the Black Eagle thinks they're going to catch the tyrant while he's still a kid or something? That's rubbish, said Justin. It's them who are going to cause a tyrant to rise up, what with their cruelty and all. Maybe it's a 
what do you call it, self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, I ain't sure what's going on in the rest of the wide woodland realm, but I know the Black Eagle can't keep this up forever, said Fuga. That's right, added Gretchen. Garrett seems like a good man. If anyone can put a stop to this, he can. Garrett, squeaked Blake. Blakey, he's the heir to the throne. He's the rightful king. When he finds out what's going on over here, he's going to come down on these Black Eagle like a hammer. But, Ma, what if it's the same all over? What if they overthrew him or something? She did not reply. Lucas worked quickly. His brush wand was zinging across the canvas. He had blocked in what looked like yellow hills. Everyone became tired of talking and soon heads were bobbing. Fuga and Gretchen ended up at opposite ends of the couch. Their legs were tangled up together. Fuga's snores were like a growling beast. Justin slept silently under the coffee table. Blake was sprawled on the floor and he covered most of it. Gigi was in an armchair, upside down. His head dangled where his feet should have been and his glasses had slipped to his forehead. That's it! yelled Lucas. It works! Gretchen shot up. Her face was hidden behind a tangled mass of hair. Her foot accidentally thrust into her husband's groin. Fuga thudded to the floor, groaning. Blake's eyes opened up and the first thing he saw was just him banging his head upon the coffee table's underside. It was Blake's laughter that woke Gigi, who tumbled out of his chair. What happened? asked Gigi. I'm done with the painting, replied Lucas. Hey, look said Justum as he pointed to the window. It's morning. He's been at that painting all night. Lucas, do you realize you've been up for two days straight now? Lucas held up his painting for all to see. Upon the stark white canvas, there was a realistic depiction of piles of gold coins. Everyone looked at each other peripherally without turning their heads, not quite sure what to say. It was a skillfully rendered painting, of course, but the subject matter? Oh, that's... that's nice, honey, Gretchen weakly said, sounding patronizing without intending to. Lucas tipped the painting forward, and the coins slid out of the canvas and onto the coffee table. The jingle was loud as the coins accumulated. The table cracked and collapsed. Fortunately, Justin was no longer under it. When the canvas was emptied, there was a mountain of gold in their living room. My goodness, bellowed Gretchen. Lucas rotated his shoulder as if he were in pain. It wasn't easy painting all those little coins. Um, Lucas, said Gigi. Don't worry, Gigi. I cleaned the brush very well, very thoroughly. I wasn't going to ask you that. I was going to say that all this new money could possibly ruin the economy. What economy? said Justum. It's the Black Eagle's economy now. If they want gold, then let's give them gold. I don't care what it does to their economy. Well said, replied Lucas. Aye, I'm with Justum on this one, added Blake. I suppose you have a point, Gigi conceded. Here's my plan said Lucas. We'll take these coins and distribute them anonymously to Devonstone residents. Then everyone will have enough money to pay their taxes. If gold becomes obsolete, then I'll just paint up whatever the Black Eagle wants. That is, until we can figure out how to get rid of the whole lot of them. This has got to be the strangest dream I ever had, said Gretchen. Money raining from a painting. I got some imagination. No, this is real, said Gigi. Lucas's brush is really a wand. He can bring his paintings to life with it. They were forced to explain the nature of Lucas's brush to the leather hides, who were ignorant about matters of magic. They were, however, grateful to have money again. Just him's pockets were already bulging. Chapter 22 The Good Works of Archer. Lucas! Mr. Klovenhoof was yelling again. Stand up and get to the back of the class. Clearly, though, that isn't working. Next time I catch you sleeping, 
I'll be forced to send you to Principal Philip. Professor, Blake interjected. Lucas was up all night working on a very important project. Oh, really? And what might that be? Blake looked at Lucas, who shook his head. Sorry, said Blake, but I ain't at liberties to say, sir. It's Lucas who won't be experiencing liberty, and you might be joining him, Mr. Leatherhide, should you not allow me to continue with the lesson. There was a noticeable change in Mr. Clovenhoof's attitude. Everyone realized it probably had something to do with the new rounds of tax collection. After class was dismissed and Mr. Klovenhoof watched the last students exit his classroom, he was surprised to find a hefty bag of gold coins upon his desk, which definitely was not there moments ago. While in the hallway, Blake was hounding Lucas. I swear, Lucas, she winked at me on the way to school. It was deliberate, I'm telling you. Darlene, replied Lucas. Darlene, Millie? But you two are so different. What's that supposed to mean? Blake, said Justin. What he means is Darlene might want a boyfriend who she could kiss without needing a ladder. Besides, if you two should kiss, you might accidentally inhale the poor girl. I ain't no damn ogre. Of course not, said Lucas, trying to smooth things over. So you really think she likes you, huh? Yeah. So... I'd like to ask a favor of you. Sure, anything. Just name it. Well, Darlene likes a certain kind of flower. The snowy peak indigo. Blake, said Gigi. Those are extremely rare, and they only grow in the mountains at very high altitudes. Right, I knew they're rare. That's why I wanted Lucas to paint one for me. You know, with his special brush and all. Sure, Blake, I'll I'll give it a try. You got a picture I could work from? I saw one in some of the reference materials in the art studio. Blake, said Justin, if you don't mind me asking, how exactly do you know Darlene likes the snowy peak indigo? Well, you fellas might be mad if I tell you, but I've been talking to a friend of hers, uh, Wendy, Wendy Windmill. Square! yelled Lucas. Oh, no, Blake, she's messing with you. Merryweather's behind this. I guarantee it. Snowy Peak Indigos are probably poisonous or something. They aren't poisonous, said Gigi. I ain't seen Merryweather around at all, said Blake. Besides, being nice and not calling Wendy things like square goes a long way. Okay, Blake, I'll do my best. Just... Be careful about Merriweather. When Lucas said that, Blake smiled widely and forcefully slapped him on the back, ignorant of his own strength. The sting on Lucas's back underscored his desire to not disappoint his enormous friend. Gigi, Justin, and especially Blake had trouble concentrating on their own art projects, for they were preoccupied with watching the snowy peak indigo literally come to life on Lucas's canvas. That's truly remarkable, said Mrs. Leafton. It looks as though I could almost touch it. I've never seen such realism, Mr. Archer. She stopped and sniffed the air. Perfume? She looked toward Blake. That's lovely. Mr. Leatherhide, what are you wearing and where can I find some? Lucas, Gigi, and Justin snickered. When art class was over, Lucas beckoned Blake to his easel where the snowy peak indigo was finished. It was painted plainly on a white background. It had strikingly blue pointy petals sprouting from a long, leafy, and dark green stem. Blake's eyes widened as he gazed at the beautiful flower. It reminded him of Darlene. It's perfect. She'd love that, I'm sure. Go ahead, said Lucas. Grab it. Blake looked skeptical as he tentatively reached toward the canvas with his huge open hand. When his fingers should have made contact, they instead went into the white space. He stumbled, shocked that his arm was in a painting. 
He gripped the flower and quickly pulled it out, slightly fearful that his arm might turn into paint should it remain in the canvas for too long. The flower was real. Wow, thanks, Lucas. Uh, I'm real grateful and all. Just do me a favor and be careful Merriweather isn't playing a prank on you. Lucas, I'm sure Darlene ain't conniving with Merriweather, but I'll keep an eye out for the purple-headed booby anyways. Mrs. Leafton stood by the door of the art studio as the students filed out. She said her goodbyes and see you tomorrows to each of them. Blake was careful to hide his flower from sight. She probably would not take it well if she knew Lucas's paintings were coming to life again. When the studio was empty at last, she returned to her desk and sat down. She yelped and quickly stood when she sat on something that was not in her chair a moment ago. A heavy sack of gold coins. Chapter 23. Goodbyes and Endings Lucas's plan had an unintended effect. The Black Eagle did not understand why everyone was suddenly able to pay their taxes, but they happily accepted it nonetheless. Black Eagle soldiers were donning shiny new armor and wielding sharp new swords. They had even hired groups of bounty hunters to try to catch fugitives, like Lucas's godparents and the wayward queen. Lucas's gold was enabling the Black Eagle's oppression. That year slowly dragged on. The boys were no longer allowed to leave on hunts, but they were able to afford food thanks to Lucas's gold. Though Lucas's wand was powerful, Gigi failed to think of a way to combat the entirety of the Black Eagle with it. Lucas thus spent the year finally honing his ability to paint objects into reality. Blake and Darlene turned a lot of heads. Many thought they were a cute, though unusual, couple. After ten months of seeing them hold hands, kiss, and whisper sweet nothings, Lucas was finally convinced that Darlene was not an ally of Merriweather's after all. Justin found a way to take advantage of the situation by wooing Darlene's friends, who were more accessible and open to the idea of talking with the boys after Blake's pioneering relationship with Darlene. The boys also spent their last day at West Woodland Middle School that summer. They would no longer have classes with Mr. Colovenhoof and Mrs. Leafton. It was time for high school. By fortune of geography, they were slated to attend the most prestigious high school in the Woodland realm, Yellowleaf, for its campus happened to be a short distance east of Devonstone. Students from all over the Woodlands traveled to Devonstone to attend Yellowleaf, even the most highly gifted students from the big cities. Girls still had to attend a separate school, Lilypad High, which was increasingly frustrating for teenagers, especially for Blake and Darlene. One day, during their summer vacation, Gigi, Justin, and Blake approached Lucas, and they looked gravely serious, which was far different from their usual boisterousness. Lucas, please sit down, said Gigi. Why? Lucas's heart started to race. Gigi answered with a sigh. Blake made an attempt. Lucas, um, your godparents, they ain't around no more. Yeah, Blake, I know. No, Lucas, just him interjected. What your mates are trying to say is, is that they're dead. No, answered Lucas. How would you know that? Well, they posted some signs in the plaza. They show who's been apprehended, who's still at large, and who's been executed. They were executed? Lucas felt a swelling of grief and rage. He looked as though he was going to speak again, but said nothing. His eyes glistened. He spun around and marched briskly toward the central courtyard, unbelieving and unyielding. The other three followed him from about twenty feet behind. He almost did not want to know what they knew, but they had to be wrong. He had to confirm that. Of course it was a mistake. He noticed several people leaving the courtyard who were crying. That did not reassure him. 
There were several new large white signs which the Black Eagle had posted upon a brick wall. It was a long list of captured fugitives in alphabetical order. Lucas's eyes immediately drifted to the D's. He found his godparents. They had been reduced to mere words on a wall. The sign stated with utter finality, Day, Frederick and Valerie, apprehended, tortured for information, executed. Lucas sobbed. He thought for a moment. All that shiny new armor, those sharp new swords, and the diligent newly hired bounty hunters all bought and paid for by Lucas Archer. His conjured gold jingled in the pockets of the people who killed his godparents. A great pang of guilt engulfed Lucas like the opposite of a hunger pain. In fact, how could he ever eat again? He felt like vomiting. Lucas immediately decided to never paint anything the Black Eagle required again. Unfortunately, that meant some people might become slaves or prisoners. There was no solution, however, in a more powerful Black Eagle army. Either way, people were going to suffer. Gigi pointed out that the queen was still at large. That settled it. Lucas's godmother could not have been the queen, or they would have listed the queen as captured and killed, rather than Valerie Day. At least, Lucas thought, he could not be the menacing megalomaniacal madman known as the Tyrant King. Lucas and his friends quietly retreated to his godparents' house on Maple Street, if only to think about the old times when they were alive. Gigi, said Lucas, I used to actually think that I might be the Tyrant King. Gigi winced and recoiled. Why would you think something like that? My godmother was at large for reasons unknown. The queen was at large. I thought maybe she was the same person. My godmother, the queen. Just picture this. I inherit the kingdom. I can do magic. I was born of the woodland realm. It all fits perfectly. Before today, I could have been the tyrant king. Gigi nodded. Remarkable. I can see why you felt that way. I hate to break this to you, but your father, Mage Ambassador Archer, was a duke of the woodland realm. Technically, you are royalty, Lucas. Gigi laughed. You aren't a tyrant, though. Far from it, actually. You're one of the best people I've ever known, if not the best. Besides, the queen's son, Garrett, has rights to the throne, along with probably a dozen others before you ever would. So, you see, I highly doubt you could ever be the tyrant king. Thanks, Gigi. That is reassuring. Middle school was over. Lucas's godparents were dead. It was a strange time. Chapter 24 Builder of Machines Once again, there was no end of summer festival to mark the changing of the season. Lucas grew older regardless. He was 14. He was becoming tall and strapping. Gigi was still taller, but remained as gangly as ever. Blake got bigger, which was thought impossible. Just him stayed small, which he did not mind, for it suited his less-than-legal covert activities that required a small body to slip into the shadows. Yellowleaf High School was far more grandiose than West Woodland Middle School. The halls were packed with students Lucas had never seen before. They hailed from Atrium City, Border Wild, Crackleweed, and there were even sons of Black Eagle soldiers from the desolate mountains. Lucas was no longer popular amongst the diverse new crowd of students. At least he still had a small following of admirers who came from West Woodland. Mostly he would have to forge a new reputation. For Lucas, that meant acting naturally. Their teachers and classes were much more formal. Teachers were known only as professor. There was no longer simply art class, but instead classes like color theory and methods of composition. Science became engineering and advanced physics. One student in particular had universal infamy that transcended all the school's cliques, Zeke Whitmark. 
though very young, was an engineering major who had already received acclaim from his field's leading members. The world's greatest minds in their elite circles kept a close watch on the comings and goings of Zeke. The Black Eagle even showed interest in him, for they believed Zeke might, one day, design new, more powerful weapons for them. Lucas first noticed him in his painting class, which Zeke attended thinking it would be an easy way to maintain his high grade point average. He was small and had messy black hair. He wore glasses of his own design, which had several different types of lenses that could swivel and click into place as he needed. Zeke had mysterious little gadgets of all sorts strapped to his arm or ankle or back. He looked ridiculous, but did not seem too concerned with appearance. Because of his reputation, everyone left him alone. Zeke managed to annoy Lucas, an achievement in and of itself, for he was unusually noisy in painting class. Their first assignment was to paint a self-portrait, which Lucas had never done before. He was using collovium and was curious as to whether he would soon have a twin. He could hardly concentrate, however, for Zeke was constantly clattering metal parts. What are you doing? asked Lucas as he turned to face Zeke. We're supposed to be painting a self-portrait. Zeke looked at Lucas with one eye behind a magnifying lens and the other behind a red-tinted lens. He looked highly affronted and ridiculous. I'm building a sculpture. It is a self-portrait. This is a painting class. When it's done, I'll paint it. Lucas laughed. He felt the need to ease the escalating tension. He wanted to make friends on his first day of school, certainly not enemies, especially ones as infamous as Zeke. Sorry if I seemed rude. My name is Lucas, Lucas Archer. Does it look like I care what your name is? Lucas still felt determined to salvage the situation. No, I guess not. Listen, I didn't mean to offend you, if that's what I did. I just couldn't concentrate with all the noise you were making, so I guess I lost my temper a bit. Sorry. Zeke paused, blinking as if he did not properly hear Lucas. He continued to fumble with his metal parts, deliberately making even more noise than before. Lucas did not perceive the passive aggression of Zeke's more vigorous rattling. Well, what's your name? Of course, Lucas already knew, but he thought it more polite to ask. Zeke had enough banter. Oh, please just be quiet. You know what my name is. Everyone knows who I am. I'm already sick and tired of you small town people. You're right. I've heard of you, Zeke. Lucas was annoyed again. I was just trying to introduce myself. You know, that's what civilized folk do. Even us small-town people? Zeke laughed flatly. Oh, now I'm not civilized. If you had ever even seen a place like Atrium City, you'd fall on your knees and cry. You know nothing. Zeke pants, I was born in Atrium City. Haven't you ever heard of Duke Archer, mage ambassador of King Narmonius? He was my father. So maybe you should care about names after all, because you never know who you're talking to, and maybe you don't know as much as you think you do. Ha! <laughs> Dukes! Kings! They achieve stature simply by being born. Hence, they're worthless. I, on the other hand, worked hard for my achievements. Indeed, I'm sure it took many long years of practice to become such an arrogant little brat. Who do you think you're talking to? You're a nobody. You mean nothing. Then why do you seem so bothered by what I, a nobody, thinks? Zeke ignored Lucas and went back to his sculpture, which looked more like an inside-out clock covered with gears. Lucas turned around and went back to his painting, disillusioned. He had never encountered anyone with whom he could not make any friendly progress. He even tried acting like Zeke a little, but that only offended him even more. Usually, Lucas found, people could relate to those who resembled themselves. But Zeke was a complete oddity. Perhaps his arrogance was somehow related to an insecurity that caused him to dislike himself enough for that tactic to fail. 
After class, Lucas put his self-portrait aside. He needed several more sittings to finish it. Zeke put his work aside as well, which looked like a pile of junk. At lunch, Lucas met up with Gigi, Blake, and Justin, who all had different classes. Hey, Gigi, said Lucas. What classes did you have this morning? I was in advanced chemistry, which I thought might help with potions. I also had woodland history, philosophy, and study hall. What about you, Blake? I had uh, woodworking, biology, math, and... uh, Blake said the last two words with his hand over his mouth. What? I didn't hear the last one. Culinary arts. I'm taking a cooking class, all right? No worries, Blake. You gotta eat, right? Well, I thought I'd learn how to make some nice vittles for Darlene. She likes fine cuisine. Ah, I see. Good thinking. What about you, Justin? What have you been taking? Geology. Might be some useful info on precious metals, stones, gems, and whatnot. I also have economics. After that, I have geography. And I got study hall with Gigi. Lucas talked about his classes, painting, world history, zoology, and sociology. He also talked about his confrontation with Zeke Whitmark, whom Lucas was suddenly keen to address as Zeke Pants. I heard he's a genius, said Gigi. Oh, he's a smartass, all right, said Lucas. I think he's gonna be in me engineering class after lunch, said Blake. Lucas, you want I should bash his face in? No, of course not. The next morning began innocuously. Lucas had begun blocking in various values in the blank face upon his canvas. His self-portrait had no discernible facial features yet. Zeke continued to rattle and clink his metal parts, which was still distracting, but Lucas abandoned any thoughts of talking to the strange, rude boy. Eventually, he got used to the noise and was more able to concentrate on his painting. He was not able to concentrate for long. Suddenly, there was a large bang as an explosion occurred behind Lucas. Zeke accidentally caused his contraption to explode during a critical stage of construction. It sent metal shards flying through the art studio. Several screams erupted as students were sliced. Most were superficial wounds. Lucas, however, received the worst injury, for he was closest to the incident. A piece of shrapnel sliced through the back of his left ear, cutting a notch into it. Blood splattered across his painting. Lucas yelped and dropped to the floor, taking cover. Zeke seemed pleasantly surprised with the accidental explosion. That was great! Are you mad? shouted Lucas. Look what you did to my ear! A steady stream of blood ran down the side of his face, onto his neck, and disappeared beneath his shirt. Soon, a red blotch spread upon his shoulder. Hush up! It's not that bad! One day you'll be telling your grandchildren about the day the one and only Zeke Whitmark cut your ear. Lucas punched Zeke in the face with such force that his strange glasses went sailing across the room. Zeke scrambled backward, shocked and scared. He darted out of the room. No one in the class that day thought Lucas overreacted, including the professor, who dismissed Lucas's assault entirely. The students cleaned up the class, but Lucas and a dozen others were sent to the nurse's office. Lucas went to lunch with a heavily bandaged ear and had much to tell his friends. News of the explosion, however, had already spread throughout the school, so they knew something happened. Blake was across the hall in culinary arts class when he heard the explosion. Lucas explained everything. That does it, said Blake. I'm gonna bash his face in. Blake, I already did that. The rest of the day went as normally as could be expected with a stinging, bleeding ear. Lucas had to return to the nurse to replace bloody bandages, but he did not want to go home as the nurse suggested. The next day, Lucas returned to painting class fully expecting Zeke to be absent. Suspended, maybe? But he was there, looking angry. Lucas ignored him while setting up his easel. He had much work to do if he was to conceal the blood splatters that plagued his painting, 
which was turning out well until the explosion. Lucas took out collovium and was about to load it with paint when he heard Zeke's arrogant voice. Well, 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 said Zeke. I didn't think you were stupid enough to come back to school. What's wrong with you? Just leave me alone. You'll be alone, all right, for a long time. What are you talking about? Lucas wanted to punch Zeke's smug face again. He turned to look at Zeke and was sorry to see that his face was badly bruised and his special glasses were cracked in several places. They'll be here any minute now. Zeke pulled a watch out of his pocket, examined it, and tapped the glass a couple of times. Don't even think about going anywhere. Zeke briskly walked to the door and peeked into the hall. Not there, he said to someone in the hall. That's the wrong room. He's in here. Zeke moved away from the door, giving whomever he was speaking to a wide berth. Suddenly, several Black Eagle soldiers burst through the door. Zeke pointed at Lucas and the soldiers hurried toward him. Lucas stuffed collovium into his waistband as he stumbled backward. Within a few quick strides, the soldiers were upon him, grabbing his arms. Wait, what did I do? It was just a punch! Just a punch! Lucas screamed as the soldiers dragged him out of the art studio. This one ain't ever gonna see the light of day again, said one of the soldiers. Zeke laughed loudly. Chapter 25 Beauty and Brutality Lucas looked calm, though he was terrified. He was a model captive and obediently walked with them. The soldier's grip on his arm was vice-like. Lucas quickly noticed, however, that the man could not sustain such a grip. As Lucas behaved surprisingly well, the man's harsh grip relaxed. Lucas jerked his arm free and sprinted down the hallway. Hey, bad idea! The soldier's voice echoed ominously. One moment he was in his favorite class, about to continue his self-portrait, and the next moment his life as he knew it was over. Like his godparents, he was a fugitive, destined to be tortured and killed. Lucas's footfalls were loud and incongruous at first. Then the sounds of the soldiers' scrambling chase flooded through the school with their clunky armor and heavy thudding boots. Lucas's body was tingling with fright and readiness. His senses were never more attuned than they were then, hearing the shouts of his pursuers, feeling the stairs beneath his feet, trying not to stumble, his entire body suddenly electrified, seeing the world become a blur as he rushed through it. The more you run, the worse off you're gonna be! Lucas ignored their threats and ran as fast as his body allowed. There was a soldier guarding the exit. He saw Lucas and immediately joined the chase. Lucas spun around, but his original pursuers were there, nearly upon him. They thundered down on him from both sides of the hall. Lucas plowed through the nearest door. It was a chemistry class. He scrambled through, clumsily knocking over delicate glass instruments, which shattered on the floor. Students bolted upright. The soldiers careened into the room, nearly tripping over each other. Gawking students and desks blocked Lucas's path, so he crawled beneath the desks, toward the back where there was another door. The soldiers carelessly upturned the desks as they went, causing chaos and destruction. Everyone gave them a wide berth. Lucas tried the door. It was locked. His fumbling fingers felt incredibly inefficient or somehow impaired as he tried to turn the lock and his fingers slipped several times. The soldiers were once again nearly upon him before he managed to unlock the door and plow through it. He was back in the hall. Several students were peeking into the hall from various classrooms, wondering about the source of all the commotion. Blake was among them. When he saw soldiers chasing Lucas down the hall, instinct took over. As Lucas ran by, Blake plowed into the group of soldiers, which knocked three of them down and caused the rest to focus on Blake. Lucas never even knew Blake was there and certainly did not realize anyone had slowed his pursuers. If he had known, he would have foolishly stopped to try and help Blake. Fortunately, he never stopped. Lucas was headed for the exit again, which was free of the guard who was now behind him, giving chase. When Lucas dashed outside, the cool breeze of freedom hit him, and he felt slightly safer. 
he could at least put some distance between himself and those relentless, cruel men. He expected to hear their pursuit before he actually did, thanks to Blake's sacrifice. Lucas was already down the street before several of the soldiers came tumbling out of the school. It took them another precious moment to figure out which way Lucas had gone. When they spotted him down the street, he was merely an inch tall in their eyes. Sprinting at full speed for so long began to take its toll, and Lucas involuntarily slowed, huffing and shaking. He kept going, though uneasily. The road was uphill, and he was nearly at the crest. The other side was hidden from him. He could be hidden from view if he just went a little farther, or... A girl's urgent squeal sounded. No, not that way. Lucas stopped. Where did that voice come from? There's a patrol that way, said the voice, and they're headed this way. Lucas spotted the girl at last. She was waving from the front door threshold of a house across the street. Lucas, for a moment, had difficulty comprehending what he saw. The girl was strikingly beautiful. For a second, he was entranced. He was not being chased. There was a girl with reddish-brown hair with slight curls, and she was looking at him. Him? Yes. Her eyes, brilliant blue, pierced into him. It was not her words, but her frightened expression that finally broke his trance. Her pretty face, with a constellation of freckles sprinkled across her cheeks, was a face of elegance suddenly contorted into intense worry. Amazingly, Lucas actually felt happiness. His immense troubles melted away and he was relieved of the gravity of the situation. Her sudden presence felt so good. Come on, she yelled in a hushed way. Get in here. She beckoned him to take refuge in her house. Lucas wanted to more than anything. He wanted to get a closer look at her, for after all, she was all the way across the street. The soldiers were coming, angrily. Lucas could see them coming. Cruel reality was back. It was too late. He could not cross the street without easily being spotted. If he could see them, then surely they could see him. Lucas was standing next to a bush. He did the only thing he could have done. He dove into the bush and concealed himself as best he could. No, shouted the girl. That's not good enough. That was all she could say before the soldiers were in earshot. Then she could say nothing. Lucas saw her close the door and then her pretty little head reemerged in a window. The unseen patrol reached Lucas first. Just as Lucas's bush finished shaking and rattling, they came over the crest. Lucas would have run right into them. He would have had to explain where he was off to in such a hurry and why he was not in school. The men giving chase would have caught up, and then it would have been all over. The girl saved his life. As it was, the two groups of Black Eagle soldiers merged in the street without Lucas between them. His pursuers ran into the patrol. You men see a boy run by? No, sir. We would have stopped him. Lucas was about ten feet away, trying to hold his breath, which turned out to be mercilessly difficult after sprinting through halls and stairs and streets. He could clearly see their wicked faces through a precariously thin curtain of leaves. You know, said one of the soldiers, I wasn't sure at first, but just before we came over the hill, I thought I saw the door to that house slam shut. Me too, added another. If he ain't in there, then whoever's in there saw him. Come on, we'll beat it out of him. Lucas felt more horrified than when they had him by the arm. That poor girl was in deep trouble unless Lucas showed himself. He could not allow her to be exposed to the brutality he knew they were all too capable of inflicting. Lucas saw a single soldier standing behind, back in the direction from which he came, back toward the school. If Lucas dashed toward him, he would only have to contend with that one man. Sure, they would see him, but if he got around that one man, he might be able to get away again, and the soldiers would be drawn away from the girl. After all, the soldier did not seem that big. He could do it. Lucas leaped out of the bush and was surprised to hear shouts just as soon as he did. There he is! Lucas bolted for the lone soldier. As he got closer, 
Much to his horror, the soldier was bigger than he originally thought. Much bigger. Lucas abandoned his initial plan of plowing him over and instead decided to fake to his left but run past on his right. Lucas's fame began with the prowess of an acrobat. He leaped to the left, and the soldier followed just as Lucas intended. Unfortunately, Lucas was too committed to his fane, putting too much energy to the left, so that when he tried to change direction to the right, his foot kept sliding left and Lucas crashed violently to the ground. Immense pain radiated from his wrist as he tried to stop his fall. The chase was over. The soldiers on patrol laughed heartily. The others, who had been chasing him from the school, looked much too furious to laugh, and they were upon him in a few quick strides. Lucas did not realize how potent pain can be. He had endured bad spills before, but nothing like what the Black Eagle was about to do. Those men made certain that they plagued Lucas with pain that trivialized any pain he had ever felt before. They kicked him repeatedly. His body fully absorbed the brunt of their stomping feet thudding against his torso as if they were trying to make him a permanent part of the street. He tried to guard himself at first, but soon his limbs went limp and he was like a rag doll. He wished he would lose consciousness or even die. Anything to end the agony.